his way, devil is on his way, devil is on his way, motherfucker, oh, the devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees, devil is on his way, fall to your knees, devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees, devil is on his way, motherfucker, he's on his way. Mountain Murders is an Appalachian true crime podcast. Listener discretion is advised. The show contains graphic language and depictions of violence. It may not be suitable for all audiences. We say fuck a lot. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Mountain Murders. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. So we meet again. Oh, baby. You look a lot like my wife. I'm sorry. I'm not. I feel bad for this woman. Oh, you're like her doppelganger. Oh, man. That's just, that's a tragedy right there. It's not. It's a good thing. No. That means I have two incredible people in my life. Oh. Oh, not saved. I'm not lending you any money. I was going to say something stupid. I, <laughs> no, not you. <laughs> Never. I have to say, one of our patrons and amazing, all around amazing people, Kat, has been killing it making mountain murder memes. Uh, yeah, she seems to have a talent for memes. And they are hilarious. But I must say, I do feel a bit targeted. You do? Yeah. Gee, I wouldn't know why. Well, I mean, you know, so all that stuff she says is basically true. You but make still. yourself an easy target, Dylan. But still. They're hilarious. Yeah, they're if funny. If you follow us on Instagram, you've probably seen some of the memes. If you don't follow us on Instagram, what are you doing with your life? Get on the gram. Get on the gram. Yeah. Okay, Dylan, it is that time. We need to thank our lovely patrons who've contributed at... Patreon.com slash Mountain Murders Podcast this week. Uh, yes, I would like to thank Lacey, Jessica, Jay, and James. Thank you very much for supporting Mountain Murders. They are sponsoring today's show. Yes, and we hope they enjoy the ad-free and extra content. Yeah, so if you are not a patron, consider joining up. It's a great way to support the podcast. If you enjoy the show, we offer ad-free episodes Bonus episodes, there's so much content. If you've caught up on our regular true crime episodes, Patreon is brimming with stuff you've never heard before. Oh, yes, it is. There's a lot of content over there, and we also love, love our Discord chat. Yeah, and if you sign up, you get to join in on all the fun. Resources for this series, because we are in two part three. Include a book, Child Killer, by Jack Rosewood, the HBO docuseries, Atlanta's Missing and Murdered. I used various newspaper um, articles, as well as information from, like, the FBI website, the GBI website. I mean, there's a lot of information on this case. It sounds like there was a lot of information out there. There's a ton. And it was it, kind of a it big deal. It's been tricky weeding through... All of the information and trying to compile it into three episodes because this case could literally, we could do a 10-part series on the Atlanta child murders. So hopefully I've been able to condense it down, maybe give you some information you hadn't heard before. Yeah, and I think you always do a good job at that. You know, it's interesting on this, there is just a lot of, a lot of times on a big case like this, you'll have all the information, court documents, and then you'll get a lot of, an, of opinion. But it's almost like every every time you dug somewhere new, you not only found opinion, you found more factual information. It was just like, you know, multiple rabbit holes splintering off of it. Yeah, like I said, it is definitely a case that, I mean, we could spend days and days um, discussing. And, of course, if you're interested in learning more, maybe some things you didn't hear from us, uh, just do a Google search. You're going to find plenty of information on this case. Are you ready to get into part three, Dylan? Yes, we have so much to talk about. Are we going to dive in head first? We're going to dive in feet first. Oh, okay. Yeah, how do you do that? I don't know. Only Dylan knows. Okay. I'm assuming that you would have to cross your hands over your chest, uh, you know, lock your feet together like you're jumping off the side of a ship. But it wouldn't be a dive. Feet first. That's right. Okay. Wayne Williams was born May 27th, 1958, to parents Homer and Faye. The Williams were teachers, and they owned a home in the Dixie Hills area of Atlanta. Now, Dixie Hills was once a neighborhood filled with middle and upper middle class residents, a lot of black business owners, and it was considered relatively safe. 
In the 1960s, low-income project housing units were built in the area, which created white flight. And we discussed that at length in part one. Now, the Williams decided, since their house was paid for, to stick it out in the area. I mean, it was still relatively safe, decent place to live. And many of the Atlanta child victims were also from the Dixie Hills era. According to reports, the Williams were a loving couple who doted on their only son. Wayne's home life was good. His parents encouraged his interests in music and electronics. They kept a neat and orderly home, and young Wayne didn't go without. I mean, they weren't rich, but, you know, it wasn't like he was living in poverty or like some of the victims that we've discussed who had to work really hard and their little kids just to make some pocket money. Yeah, it sounds like they were comfortable and and did had everything they wanted and most of the thing or everything they needed and most of the things they wanted. Now at Frederick Douglass High School, Wayne was top of his class and student council president. In his younger years, Wayne was considered a bit of a loner, but by high school he was a popular student. He was accepted into most regional universities in the area, but decided to forego college to become an entrepreneur instead. He would later attend Georgia State University, taking some business and finance classes. And though quite intelligent with an above average IQ, Wayne's heart was just not in college life. Yeah, he sounds like uh, one of those young people who maybe think they have a different idea in mind of what their path's going to be, and, you know, they just try to do it themselves. Now, as I mentioned, from an early age, Wayne fell in love with both music and electronics. He had an aptitude for the mechanics of electronic equipment, and he loved R&B music. Like a lot of young people at that time, he was a huge fan of the Jackson 5. Do you like the Jackson 5, Dylan? Yeah, A, B, C, one, two, three, A, B, C, baby, me and you. Oh, no, don't go like that, that's no. it. Oh. No. But yeah. Every time I think of the Jackson 5, I remember the episode of The Office. Andy has Rockin' Robin, which he sings like the three-part harmony, and it's his uh, ringtone. And they like hide the phone in like the ceiling panels, and it keeps ringing Rockin' Robin. But is Rockin' Robin the Jackson 5? It is. Is it really? Yes. Oh. What is wrong with you? I didn't know that. Well, despite his love for music, Wayne had no natural talent as a musician. I get that. (laughs) Wayne would often take radios apart and put them back together, and then he began repairing radios for friends and family to earn some extra money. When he was a teenager, his parents gave him money to start his own radio station in the family home. Yeah, that's that's really cool. You know, and I think this was uh, back then was more... So um, the age of electronics than even nowadays. Yeah, sure, we have more electronics, but this was just a a fun time when it, 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 electronics were kind of new to people. Well, they were. You yeah. know, with the music was a big deal to have a big radio, a big, big stereo. stereo system. Yeah, and TVs, and it was a lot easier for just uh, regular people to work on them. So you could definitely make a few extra bucks if you knew how to fix electronics. So he worked at some area radio stations part-time while he was a teenager because he just wanted to pursue, like, uh, as much information as he could, uh, you know, to, to, to know radio. Like, he wanted to know the ins and outs of it. And he would choose this over nor- normal, like, teenage pastimes, like, instead of hanging around with friends, driving around, cruising, maybe, you know, hitting up the skating rink, that kind of thing. He was working. Yeah, he's he was trying networking. to f- figure out the radio station. People described him as being very mature for his age, and some even said he was a bit of an old soul. Like, even as a young teenager, he seemed like a well-established, middle-aged man, you know, so in just, his maturity. He's very serious and puts, you know, con- you know con- has different interests than other young people. So, yeah, I could see that. By 1976, Williams decided to combine his interests in music and electronics um, together hoping that he could earn a living as a talent agent. Which, that does sound like it could be a really interesting and a fun job to be a talent agent. Well, yeah, if you have an ear for music, and um, then you also have a kind of an idea of how radio works. And, you know, you I, I could see you trying to put all that together to, you know, maybe um, help some lead someone through that, that system. 
He networked with radio contacts and those within the music industry. Wayne wanted to start a musical group inspired by the Jackson 5. He would recruit young, talented boys, saying he would put up money for their first demo and the band could get paid if they signed with a label. Gemini was William's brainchild, and it was named for his astrological sign. He spread word with flyers that he placed at arcades, skating rinks, and shopping centers, hoping to attract singers who wanted to audition. However, many of the places also happened to be where kids were abducted during the time of the murders. Well, yeah, and that and the cop that was one of the cops' strong connection, I think, for uh, saying, "Hey, this guy's perfect. This guy's definitely the guy." You know, Wayne Williams was a creature of the night. He made money as a freelance accident photographer. His father had also worked as a freelance photographer. Wayne would drive around Atlanta in his car all night listening to the scanner and the police radio, the police band radio. If he heard about a fire, murder, or some other type of accident, he would rush to the scene and capture photos. Then he would go home, develop the pictures, and sell them to local newspapers. He also had a video camera, which was rare at this time, and he would often sell the footage to news stations. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a pretty interesting um, job. To I forget what they call those guys, but night crawlers. <laughs> is it night crawlers? Yeah, there's the movie Nightcrawler, and right? It's about that, but yeah, yeah, and 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 um, that's a very intense job, and uh, I think you can make a good bit of money doing that in larger cities. I would imagine so. Right now, in 1976, Wayne was arrested for impersonating a police officer, and although the charge was dropped, he never gave up the police light that he kept in his car. And of course, this was right after he graduated from high school, and it could have just been a youthful mistake. Well, yeah, I would like to know all the you know circumstance. Who did he? Claimed to be a police officer too. What were the you know the situation? But yeah, that's just something that could be something a goofy kid does, you know, trying to be cool or macho or something like that. And it also could be something that someone who is not a good person does. So you just don't know. As the body count increased in early 1981, so did the public's fear and frustration. As the news made its way to national print and TV, people with money and power began to take notice. Muhammad Ali offered $500,000 for a reward leading to the arrest of the Atlanta child killer. Others like Burt Reynolds and Gladys Knight gave money. Rat Pack members Sammy Davis Jr. and Frank Sinatra performed a benefit concert for victims' families. And since CNN was based in Atlanta and was still like a new um, 24-hour news network, it was before that was a really common thing. They were kind of the first to do that. They began focusing a lot of attention on the case. Well, yeah, it was their, uh, one of their first chances to do this kind of sensationalized uh, media that we have everywhere now. But no matter how much pressure there was to solve the murders, there was only so much that the task force could do. When 11-year-old Patrick Baltazar's body was discovered in early 1981, it would be the murder that they considered that um, kind of broke the case wide open. Forensic investigators were able to recover plenty of physical evidence from the scene. Dog hairs were found along with carpet fibers, later determined to match those found on other victims. As FBI profiler John Douglas speculated, the killer would change tactics. The remaining victims were all dumped in Atlanta's rivers. JoJo Bell's body was the first to be discovered in a body of water. And we talked about that at length in episode two or part two of this show. After Patrick Baltazar's uh, body was found, uh, the victims would be adults afterwards. So he was the last, like, child, or technically, you know, considered a child murdered. The killer stopped preying on teenagers, and many wonder, was it even the same killer? Well, I mean, I could see a change of tactic here or there, like the profiler said, you know, maybe, or the heat's on, now I'm not going to dump them in, you know, abandoned lots or woods, I'm going to throw them in the river. But uh, but now we have, uh, I'm not going to attack and kill children. I'm going to do adults. That's that's pretty big changes, right? Especially when it's consistent. It's Yeah, definitely. I mean, I that's, mean it's something to consider. You're right. Beginning in May of 1981, the last six of seven victims were adult males between the ages of 20 and 28. 
all the men killed existed on the fringes of society. They had criminal records and were known to hustle for cash. Some of the adult male victims were known to be homosexual or bisexual. None of the victims were physically imposing. Most were short and slight of a slight build. Wayne Williams himself was only five foot six, which led a lot of people to question how he could have subdued his victims who were of equal or sometimes larger stature. Yeah, he wasn't. I mean, not only was he five, six, because I've seen guys, you know, five, 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 six that were built like brick shit houses, you know, short, super stocky and muscled up. Are you describing me? <laughs> no, <laughs> very, very strong guys. You I'm like know. as wide as I am tall. But he's also a slightly framed man. He, we're talking like a, what would you say, 145 to 160 pounds yeah, maybe in his about, life. Uh, yeah, about a buck 40 or something. Right, right, especially in his youth. Investigators began to piece together clues about the bodies. A body dumped in the river would either have to be pushed in from shore or dumped from a bridge. They concluded the killer must be dumping the bodies off bridges. The task force decided that they would need to to catch the killer. They were going to have to watch all of the bridges in this metro area. And there were quite a few. And this was a huge undertaking. You're talking 24, basically 24 hour surveillance of every bridge in, in, the, in and around the area. And it was for a 30 day period. Yeah, so it's a huge, and they, they even had to go so far as to bring in police academy recruits and, and um, a law enforcement students and things like that to help the manpower because they needed so many eyes on the bridges. In a one-week period, Eddie Duncan, Larry Rogers, and Michael McIntosh, all adult victims, were murdered and dumped into a river in less... I mean, this was in one week. You have three victims. And that is a significant change from the previous M.O. and cooling-off period. So, I mean, that's yet another very, very stark difference in what's been happening and what's happening now. Eddie was a 21-year-old who lived with his mother in Techwood. He worked in a small grocery store and helped out at a barber shop and also at another retail store, so he worked quite a few jobs. Eddie had some physical and intellectual handicaps. Andy, um, Eddie had a, a, I'm sorry, he had served a year in prison for petty theft, so he did have a criminal record. Eddie was reportedly friends with Patrick Rogers and Timmy Hill, two of our earlier victims. On March 20th of 1981, at around 2 p.m., he boarded a bus to drop off some dry cleaning for a friend, and then he planned to meet that friend at Courtney's Games and Things, where he sometimes did odd jobs. Eddie didn't drop off the dry cleaning until 6 p.m. Then a witness saw him around 7 p.m. heading to his apartment, and he told the witness he had $20 and planned to shoot some pool. His brother told law enforcement that Eddie told him he was going to make $200 by helping someone move to South Carolina. Ooh. He was last seen getting into a car with a light-skinned male near the Varsity Restaurant on Techwood Drive. On March 31st, he was discovered in the Chattahoochee River wearing only boxer shorts. It was 24 hours after Timothy Hill was discovered in the same location. Eddie's cause of death was undetermined. So, um, that was another thing that you pointed out. Now these victims are basically unclothed and just in their underwear, which is different. Larry Rogers was a 20 year old male who lived with a foster father on Ezra Church Drive. On the afternoon of March 30th, he was seen getting into a faded green station wagon with a light skinned man near Simpson Road and Lake Avenue. A witness would later say it was Wayne Williams. And she knew this to be true because she was a member of True Light Baptist Church, which was across the street from his residence in Dixie Hills. However, the church pastor said this woman was not a member of his of his congregation and that she, he had never seen this woman at his church. Well, I mean, so why is she um, trying? It sounds like she's trying to embellish or make her story more important. So that's, what, and that's the problem with our witnesses. Yeah, well, eyewitness can be a very good thing in a case, but and a lot of times it's just one part of it is the way your brain works, and and they'll actually believe. And I'm not saying she didn't see that, and I'm not saying she didn't see Will Wayne Williams, but you know people um, believe that they remember it like this, and they truly believe that, and they're adamant about it, 
or also in a case like this that was so huge and sensationalized, people want to be a part of it. Or it's like if, even if she saw some a light skinned man, you know, and then she sees all this media coverage and all this people talking about, oh my God, the Atlanta child murder, and then they got Wayne Williams. It's very easy for someone to, well, you know, I, I think it was Wayne Williams. And then for that to turn into, I know it was Wayne Williams. And now she's kind of trying to put herself in his neighborhood, it sounds like. And then the pastor's like, I don't know this lady. I've never seen her. Yeah, she doesn't attend church here. So that's not cool. Right. Well, Larry was found two weeks later in an abandoned apartment on Temple Street. In front of the building was a green Buick Skylark missing all its tires. It was like up on blocks. It had been stolen on March the 28th. When Larry was found, he was wearing some white swim trunks under blue shorts and a blue shirt that was stuffed into the swim trunks. Dog hairs were recovered from his body, and he died from strangulation. But again, he's not dumped in a river. He's found in an apartment. So that's different. It's very strange how much the M.O., the circumstances of where the victims are found, um, the the manner they're left in, it's, it's kind of really all over the place. I mean, it really is. Michael McIntosh was 23 years old with an extensive criminal background, having served three years in prison for armed robbery, burglary, possession of stolen property, drug possession, and attempted rape. So he is not a good guy, it doesn't sound like. He worked at Cap and Pegs, remember that place, kept popping up, with Jojo Bell. Michael was a homosexual known to frequent Uncle Tom Terrell's Gray Street house. So is that the pedo house? That's the pedo house. Okay. He knew Timmy Hill and Nathaniel Cater. On March 24th, he left his job at the Milton Avenue Foundry. And on the 25th, he entered a shop on Bankhead Highway crying. And he told the manager he'd been badly beaten by two black males. The manager gave him $12 and showed him where the nearest bus stop was. He left the store and headed toward the Chattahoochee River. It was on April 20th that his body was pulled from the river. He was naked and his cause of death was determined to be asphyxiation. Wow. Wow. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I'm just, <laughs> you, you got my, my brain's racing. With all, my brain's like trying to go in multiple directions with this information. Because, you know, one part, it's, it's really sad. That these men, you know, men are last seen, seem to be okay. I mean, he was not in okay circumstance, had been attacked or beaten. And, um, but I also want to make sure, you know, there is no, we're not drawing a correlation between being homosexual or gay and pedophilia. But I do believe the way you describe that the people around this, uh, we'll call it the pedo house, um, if, if someone was a male hustler, they may go there to um, get a few bucks, exchange sexual, you know, sexual favors for money. But we're definitely, you know, they're definitely gay doesn't equal pedophile. Oh no, not at all. No, but uh, um, but yeah, that's just it. Just my mind swimming, man. Well, this victim, I mean, he had an extensive criminal history. He claims these two men had beaten him up. I mean, this could have been a case of. You know, he was involved with the wrong people. Or he tried to rob somebody, or he, he, you know, he got caught doing some kind of petty crime and they kicked his ass. You know, it could be anything like that. 27 year old John Porter was an ex con who suffered from mental health issues and he had spent some time in a mental hospital. He lived off and on with his grandmother, but had recently been kicked out of her house when he was caught fondling a toddler that was in her care. Oh my God. He moved in with his mother near the Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. On April 12th, he was found in a vacant lot on Northwest Bender Street, and he'd been stabbed six times. His body was propped up on some steps. Now, there were fibers found on his body, which would later be tied to some of the other victims. 21-year-old Jimmy Ray Payne was also an ex-con who had served time in prison on a burglary charge. On April 22nd of 1981, he told his sister he was heading to the Omni to sell some old coins. Ah, the Omni again. Popular spot. Yeah. A lot of victims hanging out there. 
He was spotted at a coin shop on Ponce de Leon Avenue. Another tip came into police that in the days before he went missing, he was attempting to use a new identity. It was like trying to go by a new name. Well, it sounds like he's gotten into some kind of a mess or trouble. Right. Well, a week later, on April 27th, he was found by a couple fishing on the Chattahoochee. He wore only red shorts, and in the pocket was a phone number that detectives traced to an address where victim Teddy Smith had lived. His cause of death was undetermined, but the medical examiner uh, felt his body had been in the water like the entire length of his disappearance. Oh, so not one of those situations where they're somewhere else, kept somewhere else, and then dumped. Just not long after he disappeared, his body was in the water. Yeah, it had been in the water for probably the entire week. Okay, so I'd say rather not good condition. A man named Fred Wyatt would be arrested at the Cap and Pegs restaurant in possession of Jimmy's prison ID, which Fred claimed he had found on the ground. So that's kind of an odd piece of information, right? Yeah, it doesn't. Um, when you look at it, all of it together, there's just one more weird, weird thing. I mean, so if I find somebody's ID on the ground, if I don't have intentions of, if it's at a business or, you know, in front of a store, I'm going to say, hey, take it and hand it to the clerk. And here, I found this on the ground. You know, they might be back. I'm not just going to take it and keep it. Right, you're not going to put it in your wallet or your pocketbook and use it, right? Yeah, I'm not. Gonna I mean, do that's that. weird. It's strange. Yeah, it's um, that's, that's not what people normally do. William Barrett, otherwise known as Billy Starr, was a 17 year old juvenile delinquent with a rap sheet that included aggravated assault, drug violations, and theft. He had done a stint in juvenile detention before being released um, at 17. He was last seen at the McDaniel Glen housing project. A witness would later claim that she saw Billy get into a white car with a black man. On May 12th, his body was found near a wooded area off of I-20 in Glenwood by FBI agents. A witness came forward saying that he had been offered $3,000 to kill Billy Starr before he had gone missing. Okay. Now, I'm curious, does Wayne Williams have access to multiple vehicles? Because, you know, I mean, I think we all uh, recognize that, that one station wagon that he was his car, his dad's car. They shared it or whatever. But now you're hearing a white car. You, you know, you got the blue car. You got the green car. You got, uh, yeah. yeah it's... Which the Sanders, the KKK guy, the, um, yeah. he had a green, like, Buick or a green Chevy. Right. That some have said, you know, was similar to what they'd seen at these crime scenes. And so these victims you're laying out now are all the older adult victims kind of towards the end of the whole case, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's just you, you get different cars popping up, and I just I find that very strange. Well, and I did find some information, Dylan, and I didn't include it because there was just so much about it, where someone had actually traced the automobiles that the Williams had owned and the dates of these murders, and there were several times when a murder uh, a person would go missing and they believe that the murder had taken place, that that car wouldn't even have been in the Williams family possession because it was in the shop being repaired or it was like having some work done. Wow. And there, and then like they purchased this car and it was after some of the other murders had taken place. So he didn't even have that particular car when some of these murders had happened. Damn. Somebody really did some digging for that. Information. Yeah, it was a lot and I didn't add it in there, but I'm mentioning it, mentioning it now. Right. So uh, this guy was like, you know, somebody tried to pay me $3,000 to take out Billy Starr before he went missing. When Billy was found, he was fully clothed. Uh, forensic uh, evidence, uh, there were animal hairs on his body, and they found some membership cards to the East Lake Meadows Boys Club and the Willie Johnson Paint Club. There was a phone number found in his pocket, and it was traced to a white man he, who was a known pedophile in Atlanta who frequented the Omni and Five Points Marta Station looking to pick up young boys. <laughs> I, just, I mean, I know some people out there listening may be like, okay, guys, we, I mean, damn, you know, it just keeps on. It just, these connections, these, um, 
And I, and I would be very um, curious nowadays with the technology we had, if you took all this fiber evidence, this dog hair and, and the various other fiber, maybe carpet evidence and stuff they had, and had it analyzed nowadays. We're going to get to that. What the conclusion would be. We're going to get to that. Okay. Jumping ahead. I'm sorry. Billy Starr and Luby Jeter were both reported to have spent time at that man's home, this known pedophile. Um, his cause of death was strangulation, but he also suffered a poor, uh, I can't, I can't get it together today, guys. I'm sorry. A post-mortem stab wound as well. So you're saying those two other victims have been known to spend time at the home of the man whose phone number was found in the pocket of another victim. Yeah. Of Luby Jeter. Okay. Okay. 27-year-old Nathaniel Cater, an ex-con, was last seen on May 21st. He had lived with his father in the same building as LaTanya Wilson until moving to the Falcon Hotel. He worked at Adaman, which was a labor pool business, alongside Michael McIntosh. That's a great name for that. So, Attaboy. So Attaman. he knew victim Michael McIntosh. He was a known homosexual who solicited sex often at the Silver Dollar Saloon on Spring Street, which was the same place the manager of the laundromat, Jamie Brooks, um, the man said to have killed Clifford Jones, hung out at the same spot. So there's all these connections. Yeah. He was said to be an alcoholic and a drug user, often selling his body and drugs for money. The Falcon desk clerk saw Nathaniel on May 21st around 3 p.m., a witness claimed to see Nathaniel with Wayne Williams holding hands outside the Rialto Theater that same day. Another witness saw him leaving the Cameo Lounge headed for a bus stop. Now, friends reported that they saw him on March 23rd at the Cameo Lounge, and his body was found on May 24th of 1981, floating down the Chattahoochee. He was nude. Also found were a safe, some clothing, and a Thompson submachine gun. Police never disclosed what was found inside the safe. That's near interesting. his body. He died as a result of a, 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 you guys. He died as a result of asphyxia. Now his mother and sister would later claim they saw him with Wayne Williams a day after his body was found on May twenty fifth. That doesn't add up. No. So after he was found, his roommate reportedly said that a white man in a suit and a black man in a sports coat had approached him looking for Nathaniel in the days before he had gone missing and that they were very, like, intimidating and scary. Wow, I wonder who those guys were. Men in black. In the early morning hours, two police officers were staked out at the James Jackson Bridge where it crossed off the Chattahoochee. And this was on May 22nd because they had set up for like a 30 day surveillance of these bridges. Authorities had begun monitor monitoring um, at least a dozen bridges surrounding the Chattahoochee. The stakeouts were also public information. Wow. That's um, seems like something you wouldn't put out in the public. Officer Freddie Jacobs stationed on the South side of the bridge saw headlights approaching it was a 1970 white Chevy station wagon. The car drove over the bridge into Fulton County toward a liquor store on the opposite side. Then it turned around and recrossed the bridge into Cobb County. Officer Bob Campbell, stationed under the bridge on the Cobb County side, said he heard a splash as the car crossed over the bridge. FBI agent Greg Gilliland pulled the car over about a half a mile from the bridge. Guess who was inside the car, Dylan? Mr. Wayne Williams. 22-year-old Wayne Williams. You are a winner. No, now, they said the car went across the bridge by the liquor store, turned around and came directly back. Yes. Never stopped, but they heard a splash and did not see what went in the water, but they heard a splash, assuming something was thrown from the bridge. One of the officers said this, yes. Right. And the car continued, never stopped on the bridge, and continued and then was pulled over. Yes. So Wayne Williams, a little ass, I'm supposed to believe. Now, this is something me and you discussed. Seems totally impossible for most anyone, let alone a small guy. Flung a body out the window of a moving car over the edge of the bridge. I mean, that's what, is that what they're saying? Makes sense, right? <laughs> no one could do that. Even the biggest, strongest man couldn't do that. Okay. See, that, that right there, I have a problem with that. 
I have a big problem with that. Wayne Williams was the driver of this white Chevy. He was interrogated for over an hour about why he'd been crossing the bridge at an unusual hour. He said he was at the Starvin Marvin gas station trying to call a woman named Cheryl Johnson, and he was trying to locate her address. The woman was supposedly a singer who wanted to record with Williams later that day. Now, the car, he said, belonged to his uncle. The phone number he provided for Mrs. Johnson was incorrect, and there was no address for which he was seeking. So, like, the address that he gave police wasn't a real address. Well, and that's weird. And, and you're also out here, what, 2, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, supposedly going to make this business contact for something. That That's weird. I, I will give the cops that. Well, I think he was just saying he was trying to find her. He was just trying to make sure he knew where she lived. Oh, and so uh, he was out driving around and he thought he would just try to find her address. Oh, OK. And okay. his mother later said that she's the one who took down the name and phone number and the address. And she could have that she wrote that down and gave it to Wayne and she could have messed it up. I mean, she could have. And some people think maybe his mother was lying, trying to save his ass. But well, and he's a creature of the night. He's typically out around um in the night, and so he, I, I forgot that part. He claims he was just trying to make sure he knew where she was so he could make contact with her later that day. And he's always out this time of night kind of cruising around. No body was found in the area of the Chattahoochee despite dragging the river for several hours after they pulled him over, interrogated him. And so, yeah, and, and thinking that something was thrown right then, and they searched right then, and they couldn't find anything, correct? Now, yeah. So I had this thought as well. So Williams is like this nightcrawler. And if he knew that these cops were staked out on the bridges because it's like public knowledge, somebody like him, it seems, would maybe insert himself in the situation or be driving around, driving over these bridges, thinking that maybe he could catch something to Or see something. Right? I mean, he could very well have been, even though he didn't admit it, monitoring the police bands. He probably likely had the equipment possibly in the car right. because he'd done this before. So it could make sense with his given profession as this freelance photographer that maybe he was just kind of nosing around hoping that he could catch something. That he could maybe be the photographer on the scene when they pull a body out of the river or something like that, right? Anyway, authorities began surveillance on Wayne Williams and started digging into his background. In the days following the bridge incident, Williams and his father reportedly did a cleanup around the property of their home and burned photographs and negatives on the outside grill. Okay. According to investigators, Williams submitted to three polygraphs and failed them. But we know that that's BS. Well, you mean the polygraph? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's just so many reasons. Well, every to fail them. it seems every investigation when someone takes a polygraph, the police tell them they failed it. Well, I mean, there's also that aspect that a lot of people don't consider. Sometimes it's subjective by the person giving it, and, and if they want you to, I mean, and, and yeah, I mean that, that's well, very possible. Anytime they bring up the polygraphs, I'm always just like, I roll. Well, I mean, yeah, it's I mean, and and it's measuring these metrics in your body that can be you know, high or low for other reasons. You could have, you know, a medical condition. You could be nervous about the situation. You could be, I mean, there's just all these things that can affect your heartbeat and your blood pressure and blah, blah, blah. He then called a press conference at his house where Wayne claimed he was innocent and he was a scapegoat for the authorities because they couldn't catch the real killer. Well, I mean, that's quite possible. In June, Williams hired attorney Mary Welcome to represent him. The FBI said they had gotten matches between fibers found on some of the victims and fibers found in the Williams home. They said the dog hairs also matched that of Williams' dog. The Fulton County DA was not sure if he could prosecute Wayne Williams based on the fiber evidence, so new witnesses appeared with reports of seeing Wayne Williams with various victims. So what, where did these witnesses come from? Well, of course, the witnesses didn't come forward before Wayne's arrest, which was odd considering the media coverage on the case. On the cases. Yeah, and, and they're coming forward with things like, I saw that victim get in the car with Wayne Williams. I saw that victim here in the, coming out of a store with Wayne. That, that, now, this is what they're, instead of 
coming forward before Wayne Williams' name even came into the mix, hey, I saw Luby Jeter or whoever with so and with a man. Can I give you a description? Yeah, see, that's the type of thing right there. I don't, I don't trust on a very sensationalized case like this. On June 21st of 1981, Wayne Williams was arrested for the murders of Jimmy Ray Payne and Nathaniel Cater. The state allowed evidence from the other 27 victims be used to prove a pattern, which you can tell us a little bit about that, Dylan. Well, yes, in his very first appeal in 1983 to the Georgia Supreme Court, um, a Justice Richard Bell um, basically said that the, the entire trial was unfair in various manners. For one, and now Georgia state law does allow other crimes to be brought in as evidence if it proves a pattern, if it proves some kind of connection, you know, or or intent by the defendant. Well, that's kind of what I wanted you to touch on a bit. Yeah. Is that is allowed in Georgia. That is allowed, but um, uh, Justice Richard Bell argued that those mur- five of the ten murders that were used in that manner as evidence particularly, and he, he meticulously picked these cases apart uh, as far as all the evidence for them and stuff, did not prove any kind of connection, and, and they did not prove any pattern or motive by Wayne Williams, and his eyes should have never been brought up in court. And he was also, um, the fiber evidence, He didn't the, the entire thing about the fiber ev- evidence, which um, that was all from the previous murders. Yeah, and we can get into that more when we after we yeah. talk about the first trial. Well, the original medical examiner ruled that Payne's death was undetermined, which meant it could not be proven that he was murdered. However, before the trial started, the medical examiner issued a death certificate revising his opinion to reflect a homicide. Okay. Yeah. Which, I mean, that does happen. You know, they do, it does get changed sometimes or... But I mean, this is all. These all seem very coincidental, and, and it all strengthens the case of the prosecution. So I don't know. Jury selection began on December twenty eighth of nineteen eighty one. Nine women and three men uh, were to hear evidence in the trial. Eight of the jurors were black, and four were white. Williams' defense was not given enough time to interview hundreds of witnesses before the first week of January nineteen eighty two when opening arguments would begin. Witnesses who claimed to see Nathaniel Cater with Williams were not disclosed to Williams' attorneys. They knew the prosecution was going to bring in other cases, but they were not told which ones. I don't see how that was allowed. The prosecution didn't turn over their Brady files, which was information collected by police and other experts that point toward Wayne Williams' innocence until the last minute. Atlanta Safety Commissioner Lee Brown had publicly stated numerous times that there was no connection between the series of murders. But during the trial, he would testify to the pattern used by the killer. See, this is, if you have a strong case, and I, and I know you always worry about what the jury's going to do. Because, I mean, you know, I've seen slam dunk cases, what I consider slam dunk, and people be innocent. But if you think you have a strong case, I don't understand why you're doing these things like this last minute or not telling the prosecution or the defense about witnesses and stuff. Because you very well could be setting up grounds for an appeal later. So you could be fucking yourself in the first place. And there very well could be a sculptory evidence in some of these things that you're not disclosing to the defense. That could very well reverse a guilty com- a guilty conviction. Unless so- you're in Georgia, apparently. Unless <laughs> you're worried that your case isn't that strong. The carpet fibers found on the victims that matched Wayne Williams' home was inconclusive evidence, as it was a popular carpet found in many apartments, houses, and offices throughout the Atlanta area. No fibers, hairs, or other evidence was found in Williams' home or car. So how the transference of evidence from like the Williams home to victims, but not from the victims to Williams home or vehicle was never explained. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't doesn't make sense at all. As far as fiber evidence goes, it doesn't work like that. You know, you're finding stuff on the victims, but you're not finding anything from the victims in, in, in the car, in the home, you know, around anything connected to Wayne Williams. The defense argued that perhaps Cater and Payne had not died as a result of foul play at all. 
Payne had a history of attempted suicides, and Cater was a known alcoholic and drug user. They were also both adults, which didn't fit into any pattern that the prosecution was presenting. Bobby Toland, an ambulance driver who'd worked with Wayne Williams, took the stand for the prosecution. Toland claimed that Williams was racist and hated poor black youth. He often said he wanted black children dead. Now, couldn't that be considered like hearsay? Well, I thought I mean, that I'm was. I'm not sure, but I thought that was the definition of hearsay. Getting one a person to say something they heard someone else say without any kind of evidence. I mean, isn't that what hearsay is? I, I mean, that's I'm kind of sure. what I thought. Yeah. So I'm like, how? Because then anybody could come forward and be a witness, right? And say, well, I heard this person do this. Yeah, well, I would be um, um, curious if in the transcripts the defense objected to that and if it was, you know, not not sustained. Because, I mean, I, th- I think I definitely would, right? Another damning testimony came from William's friend, Sharon Blakely. She testified that Wayne had confided that he would confess if the evidence mounted against him, and she admitted that she believed Wayne was guilty. Williams took the stand and claimed there was no way he could have stopped his car on a bridge and hoisted Nathaniel's body from the back of the car and thrown it over the shoulder um, and then over these high guard rails, like out the car window. Yeah. So, like, not only did this timing not work based on the police officer's recollection, but Cater was much larger, much a lar- like was a much larger guy than Williams was. The quality of the evidence against Wayne Williams was never truly questioned, and in the end, Williams was sentenced to two life terms in prison. And the Atlanta PD closed twenty-two of the twenty-nine cases, saying they had conclusively linked Wayne Williams to these murders. So they try him for the uh, murder of two adults. Yes. He's found guilty. Right? Yes. And then they take all these child murders, all this big case, you know, connected case, and never once try him for even a single murder of any of those children. They don't even pick out their strongest, you know, case that has the most connections to Wayne. And, and evidence and do him for at least one of them so they can say, look, we have the child killer. They did none of them. They did. And then that blows my mind. And Wayne famously blew up on the stand. He did. Yeah. He and famous- that was part of the problem with Wayne Williams is that he definitely was not, he didn't do himself any favors. No. His testimony was probably more damning than anything. Yes. I think he came across as arrogant. Because he did lose his temper. And he lost his temper, and he said something to the effect, um, you want the real Wayne Williams, you're going to get the real Wayne Williams. And which, I mean, why, why in the world would you say that on the stand? But he kind of lost his cool with the prosecutor on, I think it was the second day of testimony from him. And uh, a lot of people present at the trial felt like he was in kind of a decent position before he blew up on the stand. And that that could very well be one of the things that um, sent them over the edge to a guilty conviction. Doubts arose from the beginning about Wayne Williams' guilt. Many Atlantans, including victims' family members, felt there was a larger conspiracy at play. The government and local police simply wanted to close the murder cases. Wayne Williams has stated for the record in recent interviews that he was his own worst enemy. He was a cocky young man who had a bad temper no reason for being on that bridge, and not a single person testified to having witnessed Williams assault, abuse, or kill a single victim. There was also no link to Eric Middlebrooks, the Porters, Evans, Stevens, or the Baltazar case. The standards for convictions and evidence were not met. Former DeKalb County Sheriff Sidney Dorsey searched the Williams home for evidence, and he has said that he does not believe Wayne is guilty. Wow. FBI profiler John Douglas has said he thought Williams was guilty of some murders, but not others. He believes the Atlanta Police Department knew well who was responsible and that the truth was far worse than thought. That the crimes were basically like a massive police cover-up, like attaching Wayne Williams' name to all of these child murders. Wow, that that blows me away. In 1983, Williams' attorneys asked for a new trial on the basis of 33 points of error in the original trial, but his request was denied. 
1985, Williams' attorney was able to get the Georgia Bureau of Investigation's KKK file, which they were able to use as grounds for an appeal. Okay. In 1986, several Atlanta news networks had to sue the PD under the Open Records Act to access the case files in the Atlanta child murder. So they were not open to, you know, giving those up to the media. And there's got to be a reason for that. Now, personally, I don't believe there was one killer operating in Atlanta at this time. First, Killers like to stick to one type of victim, typically, and there were two girls included in the Atlanta child murders cases. That doesn't just make, it makes no sense to me, basically. Now, Angel, if you remember her, she was found at Fort McPherson, and it seems more likely that she was taken maybe by an enlisted person on impulse. Uh, LaTanya Wilson had a pane of glass replaced in her window days before she was taken from that very window. Wow, that's that's wild. In the apartment building, which we talked about that in episode one or the first part of this series. The ages range from 9 to 27, and that also doesn't really make sense for me. Victims were also killed in different manners. We had shooting, stabbing, strangulation, and some were smothered. Some were left in the woods, abandoned buildings, and then others were dropped in the water. Some victims were clothed and others nude. And serial killers, as we know, tend to be creatures of habit. They almost always stick to the same methods of killing and disposal. Well, that's what um, they figured out. That's what they like. That's what gives them that rush or whatever the hell they get out of it. Because sometimes it's sexual, sometimes it's not. And you also had a blunt force trauma or two in those murders you described. In our in that age range, that's way, that's huge. I mean, that's such a big chunk of the population that just doesn't, I, I don't think someone would go that far. You either like to prey on children or, or you like to kill, you know, co-eds or prostitutes or, you know, male hustlers, whatever. That's just, um, that's, there's too many different types of victims in there. And I really do think they lumped some other, what they felt like very well could have been murdered by someone else into this group of victims. Well, let's recap some of the victim connections that we've discussed in these three parts. So the Moreland Avenue Shopping Center is where Aaron Jackson went missing. Patrick Rogers carried groceries there, and Aaron White was there the day he went missing. Then you've got the Thomasville Heights housing project, and that is where several victims lived, including Patrick Rogers and Curtis Walker. The Cap and Pegs employed both JoJo Bell and Michael McIntosh. And then that guy, Fred Wyatt, was arrested there with Jimmy Payne's ID, which is odd, right? John David Wilcoxon, he is the pedophile that we discussed in the previous episodes. Earl Terrell disappeared after last being seen across the street from Wilcoxon's home as he was making his way back from the swimming pool. Luby Jeter was seen in the company of Wilcoxon on several occasions, and Wilcoxon was later arrested for pedophilia and child pornography. And then we've got the house on Gray Street, where at least seven victims could be linked to this property. And after the arrest of Wayne Williams, that house burned down in a mysterious fire. Oh, wow. Imagine that. The police officer, who said he heard a splash on the night of May um, 1980, when Williams was originally interviewed and questioned, later said he actually didn't hear anything. Uh, he recanted his story that he didn't actually hear a splash that night. Come on, dude. So what you have is there's the, and they were approaching the end of that detail. They've been doing it for weeks, spending all this money. They had all this pressure to make this happen, to get some kind of a suspect out of this. The that dog hairs that were found on 15 of the victims were typed as... Um, coming from a Siberian Husky at the time, Williams owned a German Shepherd. The Sanders family, with the KKK ties, they bred Siberian Huskies, and they also owned a green Chevy Impala, the type of car reported at many abductions and body dump sites. And so if you're breeding Huskies, you're likely going to have more than one. You're going to have puppies. You're going to have dog hair everywhere, all over your house, in your vehicles. And that's why I was wondering... Why the so consistently the dog hair was getting on these victims? Because that was one of the consistent things throughout this entire story. 
If Wayne Williams wasn't the killer, then a terrible miscarriage of justice has been perpetuated. Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms has announced DNA testing will take place on the remaining evidence. The cases were once again being actively investigated through meticulous and time-consuming assortments of the evidence. Once submitted to the crime lab, there is no exact date on when these results will be in. Williams and his attorneys have long challenged the forensic evidence that helped convict him, mostly hairs and carpet samples, which were inconclusive. And that was the basis. That was a huge part of the prosecutions. That was the entire reason they brought in the other murders and tied it to Wayne Williams. Because in all that fiber evidence was tied up in the other murders, not the two murders he was being on trial for. A private eye named Chet Dillinger wrote a book called The List, in which he recounted the murders. He theorized, based on evidence, that the murder started in 1979 and carried on until 1983, long after Williams was sent to prison. He gathered information on 63 murders, and 22 of those occurred after Williams went to jail. So another thing people would say that supported it being Wayne The murders stopped. The killing stopped. But that's not true. The murders of young children stopped months before Wayne was arrested, and the murders of young men never stopped in Atlanta. Some of the other victims who were never tied to the Atlanta child murders between 79 and 81 were Cynthia Montgomery, Joseph Lee, Stanley Murray, Angela Bacon, and Faith Yearby, One victim, 21-year-old Vernell Ty, was strangled in the same way as many of the Atlanta child murder victims. But there's, I mean, the list is insane. It's like 22 people. So his conclusion is the murder did not stop, and the murders didn't stop, and that Wayne Williams was not the killer. That's what Chet Dellinger believes, yeah. So the police were trying to keep shootings off the list, And if they had added the shooting victims, the list would have been like 100 times longer. The murder of Smith, the very first victim, they didn't want to include his murder for a long time on their list of child murders. Now, Evan's mother claimed that the body was actually not her son. She said Evans had pierced ears and the victim that they told her was her son's body didn't have pierced ears. And she didn't believe that it was the right, that they didn't have the right body. Oh, my God. And there were several other family members who felt like the bodies were badly decomposed or that there was some reason why they were like, that's not my child. But the PD was telling them, no, that's your dead child. Oh, my God. I didn't even think about them being um, the remains, you know, beyond recognition and then being the uncertainty you would feel. You know, nowadays we have it you know, like, hey, this, you know, it's it, it's definitely your child. They, they can find one bone. But, uh, oh, my God. Well, one of the victims, um, and I didn't write the information down because, again, I was so overwhelmed with with all these names and all this stuff. Well, yeah. One of the victims had, like, kind of a prominent jawbone, and the body they found did not have that very prominent jawbone, and his family was like, there's no way that's him. Yeah, so he had more of, like, a big square jaw kind of thing. I guess he had, like, a really, you know, it was a very noticeable. Right. And that the body they found did not have. Had a narrower. And they were like, that's not our, that's not our son. That's not our brother. Wow, I didn't even know that. I know, right? I mean, how torturous would that be if you wonder if that was even the remains of your loved one? Well, if you remember, um, Evans was found along with Smith the first victim, and they didn't want to include him on the list because he had been shot. But if you remember, their bodies were found about 100 feet apart of each other at the same time. And she was the second parent to say that this victim was not her child. So there were others, like I said, that came out and said they didn't believe that the victim was actually their child. The only search that ever turned up anything was the first search that the police allowed civilians to attend. If you remember, they organized that big search with Clark College, and it was like 450 volunteers. Oh, my God. This right, this piece of information right here, I don't even know what to do with it. Well, they discovered the body of Latonya Wilson, and that body was found on a piece of property that was owned by an Atlanta City commissioner. Yes, and to remind us what the police told 
this group about that area before they searched they it. They told them not to search the area, that they had just searched it in the days before and had thoroughly searched it and didn't find anything. But these volunteers disregarded, you know, police's information. They went ahead and conducted their own search of this property and they found Latanya Wilson's body. So at the time, these searchers were very confused because they were like, you know, she was in such a um, state of decay and decomposition and she was basically skeletal that there was no way someone had just moved her body there like the day before. And so they were questioning, were the police even competent? Did they even search this piece of property? Yeah. What do you do with that? So they're telling them you're wasting your cops are like, you're wasting your time. We just searched there a couple of days ago. You should go search somewhere else maybe. And then they, they find these remains. That's obvious. They laid there and decayed. It wasn't just, you know, moved there recently. And and then it happens to be the property of a prominent a, yeah. politician. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of coincidences, I guess, could be there. But um, that seems rather weird to me. There's and then a lot of weird stuff in this case. Yeah. In September of 2014, um, William's attorney, uh, Watley, got a letter from the Department of Justice stating that at least one member of the forensic team handling the evidence for the child murders case had mishandled evidence over um, a 30-year period with errors over 90% in fiber cases and 95% um, inaccurate in hair cases and that the majority of the uh, testimony that it, that this particular examiner had given in multiple trials was um, misleading testimony. And that he handled some of the fiber evidence and hair evidence of the Wayne Williams case. Yes. Are you kidding me? No. Okay. In December of 2019, Williams was once again denied parole, and he will be eligible again in 2027. So, just a few interesting points here. A look back at a New York Times article from 1981 brings confusion to the table for me because investigators said they knew the reasons for the deaths in as many as six cases and that suspects were either relatives or acquaintances of the victims, but they walked back that theory as soon as they found Williams on the bridge. Dr. Joseph Burton, the medical examiner, said very few of the 20 deaths were related or connected at all, maybe only six or eight of those. And that the others were not the work of a serial killer, in his opinion. Okay. So it's interesting. They keep, you know, you keep, more than once in this story, you've been like, they think it's like this. Or, you know, this is how it's going. Until it's just quickly recanted, walked back, or the whole situation changed. With the witnesses all of a sudden coming forward that strengthens their case. You have the that huge admission by the cop under the bridge that no he didn't really he don't now he doesn't believe he heard a splash which was their first contact with wayne williams if i'm not mistaken and um i don't know this with the hair evidence this talking about they're not related we don't think it's you know uh, and then walking that back there was a man, and I believe he might have been a comedian. His name is Dick Gregory, and he spread a conspiracy theory around that the CDC was involved in organ harvesting and that they were using these children for that purpose. Um, allegedly, Luby Jeter had a missing penis and some other missing organs, and um, there's some cancer drug called uh, in, uh, interferon, and he believed that these children were basically being used to gather, uh, I mean, maybe it was like stem cells or, you know, something like that, um, to produce this cancer drug. And Angel Lanier's mother also said she thought this could be uh, a true thing. Like, she believed this conspiracy theory. Oh, and I guess, well, that, well that's, that's pretty wild. But I guess we have to remember the CDC is based out of Atlanta. Venus Taylor, the mother of LaTanya Wilson, said in an interview that she was told the actual killer was from one of Atlanta's richest families and that there was a massive cover-up that police knew who had killed her daughter, but money talks. Well, that would be, that would surprise me less than uh, the nefarious thing through the CDC you described. Because there would be, I guess what I'm saying, there's less public ways to get what they may have gotten from these victims in that, that theory. 
So I think they maybe would do that. Well, instead again, of, it's a conspiracy. Well, theory, yeah, but, but what it's you're describing one that's floated around. What you're describing is they find out it the the evidence leads to some prominent, super rich, whatever connected, well -connected family, family yeah. that has happened many times in history from you know various crimes and reasons. So that I could believe. Well, if you examine this pedophile anger a bit closer, Dylan, think of Texas killer Dean Coral, known as the Candyman. Oh, my God. He was such a monster. He used young men to recruit his victims for him. Yes. Yeah, so and and would... if you think of the different connections that many of these victims had to these sex offenders and these pedophile rings... Because, again, Clifford Jones was allegedly killed by a sex offender, Jamie Brooks, who was the laundromat manager. And Brooks had a history of raping other boys, and he eventually died in prison from AIDS. And there are some striking similarities to the Oakland County child killings in Michigan from 1976 to 1977. Um, the suspect in those killings, a man named Christopher Brian Bush, committed suicide. But some people have questioned, could the real killer have moved on to Atlanta? Oh, wow. See, when you have a theory, a conspiracy theory even, if it if you have all these questions you can't answer, things you can't, just don't understand why it happened, and then this theory comes along and it answers those questions with a logical answer. So with the pedophile, possible pedophile ring connection, it is... The whole time of, I said, how did the killer get these kids and young men off the street in broad daylight in a neighborhood, crowded neighborhood, without causing alarm or stir? Well, if they already know him, some connection, either they've got, you know, some drugs or sexual favor, or they just know this person, or a promise of money, get in the car, quietly get in the car. And if uh, the different M.O.'s, Okay, so if it's a connected ring, a group of men, they're not all going to be the same. Some might use a gun, some may maybe get off on strangling. So there that describes the different MOs. That describes how the victims are sometimes found back in the neighborhood and sometimes found, you know, miles and miles away. So, I mean, the pet, for me personally, the pedophile connection in ring, and, and let alone, I mean, I could talk for 30 minutes, the connections to the victims, last seen at his house, blah, blah, blah. It answers the questions, um, all the questions I've wondered this entire time, the best. I personally think that's quite likely what was really happening. The pedophile ring. I lean more toward that theory as well, Dylan. Now, another possibility that, um, you know, couch detectives have brought up over the years is... Um, that serial killer Edward Edwards, who operated for more than 50 years, was in Atlanta during this time. And he was a known police informant who worked with the GBI and was able to operate kind of under, um, under the radar because he did have these, like, police connections. Really? Yeah. Man, he had to be a serial killer with a name like Edward Edwards. Right? <laughs> yeah. So was an innocent man railroaded? Were grave errors made during the investigation? Was there a cover-up and why? If anything, I came away from this case with more questions than answers. Well, yeah. The, I mean, you had the racial tensions. So they found this black man, Wayne Williams, who um, was out at, you know, known to be out late at night, had you know connections to the neighborhood. And then once, I think once they found out his talent scouting thing, and his flyers and him kind of hanging around the edges of all where all these young people would be and, you know, asking questions, trying to find talent. I, I just think they, they ran with it. I honestly think they ran with it after that because that you could kind of fit that into the narrative of, uh, of what they wanted to say happened. Well, in the United States, when we talk about getting a fair trial, they tell the jury, you know, you have to, find this person guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Yes. And I have to say there, there was just not enough in this case that if I had been a juror, I could have convicted him because it does not go beyond a reasonable doubt for me. I have plenty of doubts in this case. It's not even close. If I was on that jury panel, 
I mean, it's not even close to reasonable. It's not even a question of reasonable doubt. This is a a very porous case that has a lot of holes and a lot of things not explained. And I honestly think that everyone was caught up in the hysteria of the child, um, you know, Atlanta child murders, which I understand. And um, I just don't, I don't, I don't think I could ever come to that conclusion either. I agree with you, Dylan. I think the hysteria, the fear, there was so much pressure for law enforcement to nip this in the bud that they got a suspect and then they just hardcore focused on him and they were going to use any angle they could to tie him to these victims and to these murders, even if the evidence was weak or it just didn't even make sense. Yeah, and that's basically what I see here and what you've discussed. Now, do I think Wayne Williams is completely innocent? I don't know. I don't know if he was involved. It would make more sense if he was guilty, possibly the later victims, but I don't believe he murdered these young kids. I just don't. And we may find out more information here over the next couple months. They are retesting some of that D- some of the DNA evidence, some of the things, the fibers, uh, all of that evidence from back in the day. And they've been working on this for some time. So, I mean, it may come out that we're all wrong and w- Wayne Williams is guilty. But we may find out that this man has been wrongfully accused and that the real killer or killers just got away with it. Yeah, and um, like Justice Bell, Justice Richard Bell, the Georgia Supreme Court back then felt very strongly uh, and wrote the dissenting uh, paper for the case. And the other justices basically told him, no, we're not going to be the guys that reverse. Yeah, they don't want their name attached to that, right? We're not going to be the guys that reverse the Atlanta child murderer's conviction. Straight up. Well, it's crazy that Wayne Williams has been dubbed the Atlanta child killer, the Atlanta child murderer, when he was never actually tried and convicted on the murders of any children. He was convicted on the two adult males. That is very strange. And I just can't believe that out of all those victims, you don't have one case, one set of circumstances that if uh, Wayne really did it, that was a very strong one. And you would have brought that forth and at least connected him to one of the child murders. And I just don't know how they got away with um, never bringing that into court and sweeping all those kind of under the rug, honestly. Wayne was a victim of the time, I believe. If he went to trial today, one, I don't think a prosecutor would even you know, charge him. I don't think they'd have try enough this case. evidence to charge him. No, no, but I think he was just a victim of the times. You know, there wasn't enough forensic evidence to conclusively say yes or no. He did this. It was still in the early stages of testing these hairs and fibers. So that was a new technology. The jury probably didn't fully understand the science behind it. The or profiling, how it the forensics. The profiling with the FBI was still brand new. And who's to say that John Douglas didn't uh, mess up with his profile? Because well, they had only been doing this for a brief period when they joined this case. That's what I said earlier. It was yeah. in such the early stages that, um, I mean, profiling nowadays really blows my mind when you when you see it compared to the actual criminal but this was, uh, they were still figuring it out. So it definitely wasn't uh, some kind of a, a, a good tool to use right back then. And the term serial killer was brand new. Like they didn't even know what to call these types of murderers before. Yeah. It's a really interesting case. And like I said, even through all of this research, I'm still absolutely baffled and feel like I don't know any more about who um, victimized these children than I did Three weeks ago. Oh, my God. I do recommend for you folks who are interested in learning more, that HBO docuseries is amazing. It's very moving. You have interviews with the family members, mothers, friends, the police force, uh, FBI agents. I mean, it's it's really a great, uh, well well done documentary. Yeah, I'm fairly certain that that's where um, Justice Bell, I saw Justice Bell and then, then looked it up, so... Yes, that's very good. A show HBO doesn't play around, right? And then, of course, there's the other podcast, Atlanta Monster. Which is very well done. It's well done. Um, 
it left me with some, I mean, it kind of left me feeling like there was still some unanswered things or um, they could have gone more into maybe the victims or that kind of thing. So um, it, it still kind of left me with some holes that needed to be filled in, I guess. But overall, I thought it was a pretty good podcast. Well, and that's why you did an incredible job here at Mountain Murders. Yes. Of really telling. Filling in the gaps. I've told you, uh, it's a lot of information and it's hard to keep up with, but telling each victim's story really makes those connections that come out later glaring connections, these glaring circumstances that kind of really doesn't add up to what the, it doesn't fit the official narrative. Okay. Well, thank you for checking out this three-part series on Atlanta child murders. Sorry, I was a little off my A-game today. It's been a long weekend. We'll take your B-game. <laughs> You'll take my B-game? Yep. Thank you. If you have any feedback or case suggestions or you just want to drop us a line, maybe you have a listener story, you can email mountainmurderspodcast at gmail.com. Of course, you can find us on Patreon, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And uh, anything else you want to say, Dylan? Yeah, yeah, we uh, we stopped uh, begging you guys for um, reviews and subscript, you know, subscribing every episode. But if you do listen to us regular, if you could just take a moment, maybe leave us a review. But more importantly, if you could just hit that subscribe button because you're going to listen anyway, and it really does help us out. And one more thing, Dylan. What? Black lives still matter. Oh yeah, they do.